Now, Jason and Michael, where exactly can the origins of the American cocker be traced back to? Well, all the Spaniels can share a common an ancestry uh, and were developed to uh, accomplish different, different manners of, in the way that they hunted. And in the same way over here, we got field Spaniels and Springer Spaniels and then Welsh Springers, Cockers. Cockers would have been initially the same breed in America as they were in England. And there was a lot of imports leaving this country to go to um, America. With their own selective breeding, they were beginning to change things a little bit. So they were creating within the cockers, like a fancier, smaller type of dog. And I think it's in the 40s that the breed was split. It wasn't two different breeds, it was just split by virtue of type. So dogs which had a slightly shorter foreface, a little bit more, a little bit more hair, a slightly sloping top line and a little bit more height of the withers became cockers. As an American, what we know as the Cocker Spaniel is one of these. So what, what the British call Cocker Spaniels, we call in the States uh, an English Cocker. Around the same time that Mike's talking about, the 40s, 50s, there was a surge of popularity. You know, these guys were the most um, popular breed with the AKC. And I guess like any breed that goes through that sort of surge of popularity, there was a, a downside as well. Yeah and you know, issues with temperament problems and everything else, but you know, it's a really typical breed to see as, as pets. So what was it that these particular breeds, Cockers, American Cockers, were bred for initially? They're flushing spaniels. Uh, you know, they're meant to flush game in various types of cover, um, retrieve when necessary. And they're supposed to obviously retrieve a smaller bird like Woodcock. And so when, when American Cockers came over and were introduced into the gun dog group, there was some resentment, as it were, and then, of course, more recently, we heard these more cri these same criticisms because Jason was shown a beautifully groomed American cocker at Croft. Now, this is the thing: there's been lots of, ca of cases where they've been excellent little working dogs, and of course, when they were worked, you would take the coat off. It, like Irish Water Spaniels, they're absolutely fantastic dual-purpose gun dogs. The same ones are shown as are worked. But if you were hard working an Irish water spaniel, you would cut the coat down. So, you know, we don't work them, but we do breed with functionality in mind, you know, that they could work. And Jason, sure. they are closely related to the, the English cockers, as you would have known them. Uh, and the cocker is always thought of as a, a merry little cheerful gun dog. Is that the same in American cocker? Yeah, absolutely. And the word, the word merry is in the standard for the breed. It's, I think if you could sum them up in one word, it would be just that, it would be merry, a wagging tail, always up for whatever adventure you want to go on. They have a really strong desire to do a job, to be with people, and they're always on the go. If you're buying a puppy, at least seeing the mother, she's got to have a good temperament. And puppies of eight weeks old should be happy and want to pick, come to be picked up and wag their tails. So it's important as a breed feature that we're all breeding for that very, very specific, happy, merry little dog. Um, and you both found the breed individually, but Mike, why was it an American Cocker for you? Well, as a kid, I used to go to the shows with a girl called Liz Buttrick. American Cockers were, were reasonably new. She bought a bitch, a little black and white bitch that um, she decided she didn't want to keep. So I think I was probably 17 or something at the time. I swapped a car that had <laughs> something happened with the engine. Her husband could always fix cars. And she was the grandmother of my first champion, a dog called Salt in the Swing. I got my first American Cocker a little bit earlier than Mike, but mine was a stuffed toy. <laughs> and actually, there's a funny picture of me as a kid um, posing my stuffed American Cocker toy uh, with a sign that says, Best in Show. <laughs> so I think from an early age, I was really drawn to the, the look of the breed, the beautiful faces, the long ears, the soft eyes. I also grew up just at the tail end of what was probably the heyday of the breed in the US. Everything about them is, makes for a wonderful pet. Mike spoke briefly about you being in the best insurance ring with that beautifully groomed American Cocker. Mm. That must take a lot of time to get Miami looking the way he did. Yeah, of course. I mean, somebody was saying, uh, comparing Crofts to sort of like going to the Oscars. And obviously, 
the way people dress when they go to the Oscars is much different than you dress when you go to Tesco. I think most of what you see in the ring really takes place long before you ever go to the show. Miami, for example, his routine is he gets a bath twice a week, and that's kind of it. And before the show, he has his face clipped, the back is, uh, is stripped, and the feet are scissored. But it's just that consistency of week-to-week -week maintenance. As a judge, what are you looking for in an American Cocker? Well, it's vital when I'm judging that I judge a dog that feels when I touch it like it could work and do a day's work. So they have to be solid. They have to have a big rib cage. They have to have a fore chest. They have to have shoulders and upper arms that mean that their momentum on the move is like easy. It means that they can tirelessly work for a long period of time. Where people get hung up on is like just a pretty face or this sloping top line that's desirable or the coat but you've got to have the essential parts of the dog right first the size of the teeth the temperament all of those things are the most important and then you can start to put on the lovely slope gently sloping top line the coat the big eyes the beautiful face the big plush foreface all of those things are icing on the cake. You've just got to get the cake right first. Yeah. And I can remember in particular with Miami, he, something that was really special about him was that he seemed to be a combination of a lot of the dogs in his family. You could see bits of his mother, bits of his grandfather. So he sort of seemed to get the best of a lot of the dogs in his family. That's what you dream of as a breeder. You're doing these combinations, hoping that you will pick up the very best features from the pedigree. Even at his very first show when he was six months old, there was an American judge and he was uh, won the CC and was best to breed at six months and two weeks of age. Crofts was actually only his ninth ever show. We really hadn't shown him at all. He, he won his title really quickly. I handled him to his first ticket. Um, our friend Susan Crummy handled him to his second ticket. And then Mike handled him uh, at Windsor for his third ticket. He was out of the puppy class. He was a champion, and I didn't feel he was ready to do anything more, so he stayed home. And then last um, fall, I took him to the Gundog Society of Wales, and that had been his first show in quite a while. He won the CC, best of breed, and then and won then the group. Best in show, yeah. And that was his last show for last year. <laughs> and then sort of to give him a run out before Crufts, I took him to the home county's American Cocker Club the week before Crufts to see how he would you know, respond, having been out of the ring all, all winter and he was best in show at the club show. And then his next stop was Crofts, so. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like he's a dog that surprised you. Yeah, it really has surprised us. I think in some ways we even underestimated how good he was, and partly that was because we hadn't seen him in the ring enough. And I think at Crofts, everything came together in terms of his development and... The other thing as well, he was really good in his class. He was better in the challenge. And we got there in time to watch him in the group. And he showed fantastically. And then when he went in for best in show, when it counted, he was stepping up a gear. And it must have been a very different experience. Ricky went in as top dog all breeds. Mm -hmm. So there was a pressure and expectation. Completely, yeah. There was no expectation because most people had never seen or heard of him. The group win, was incredible because it was such a, a beautiful group and completely caught us by surprise. We just enjoyed the show and it, it kept getting better and better and better as the week went on. Now, what do you put the success down to? I think that in the same way that somebody could be, could have a, an enormous appreciation of the ballet. I have this absolute love of great dogs. They needn't necessarily be mine, but I can get overwhelmed when I see something that I consider to be exceptional. You know, I want to breed nice, healthy dogs with great temperaments, but within that, I want to breed the next great one. Over the past few years, you've had Top Dog, Best Joke Craft twice. Top Dog four times. Four times. Overall, four times. It's, it's quite a list. Or is it five? <laughs> is it five or four? I'm not sure. To I think it's four. Um, let's not get greedy. Um, there's time. But Jason, what does Mike bring to the party at Afterglow? Well, Mike sort of started the party at Afterglow, as I, as I 
have said before, um, I think Mike is sort of has boundless optimism, boundless enthusiasm to you know try new things, and sort of a fearless about taking a risk or taking a chance on something that other people might think is crazy or too much effort or too much hassle. And Mike, Jason's strengths. Obviously, everybody knows that. Uh, we were partners in the past and we're business partners now. And he, what he's done is he's brought a lot of balance to the whole thing because I can be at times a little bit over enthusiastic and over emotional and over, well, just over. You know, I used to be considered a pretty good handler in my own rights years ago, but, you know, his prowess as a handler is kind of legendary. And um, as a team, the whole thing's worked brilliantly and, um, and we play to our strengths.